All right, on this one, I'd like to work with you a little bit on these questions in the section of your work called Differential Rate Law Practice. Differential Rate Law uh, is called that, at least in part, because uh, the idea is that to determine the rate law by this method, we use differences, we use subtraction, we look at a change uh, in concentration, and we compare that to a change in rate. And by looking at those two changes, we can find a relationship between the change in concentration of a substance and the effect that that change has on the rate of the reaction. And so in these examples, that's kind of the theme. You'll notice uh, in the data tables and the questions where this is the technique that you need to take with the problem, uh, that they'll give you a data table like the one you see here, and that'll include several experiments or trials of, an, of a particular reaction. There might be as few as three. There might be as many as, as six or even more, as you see here. You'll also notice that it gives us information on concentration of the reactants involved. And so the equation is given here at the top of the, of the prompt. We've got the chemical reaction equation. It's typically balanced already, but make, make sure to check that it is. If it's a, an equation that actually has substances you can identify in it and you'd have to balance. <clears throat> it's going to give us the concentration of at least two of the reactants. And here they gave us the concentrations in each experiment for, for A and for B. So we have both reactants. You'll notice that the table says that these are the initial concentrations of the reactants. Basics ideas, basic ideas of the kinetic molecular theory would be, of course, that as a reaction takes place, the concentration of reactants would decrease. So both these concentrations will go down as the reaction takes place. We often show that in a rice table as a minus uh, X or a, a loss, a minus of some amount. On the other hand, a concentration of C and a concentration of D will be going up. And so there might be some mention or reference in, in the data table or in the prompt or in later questions to the formation of C or the formation of D because those will be formed at a ratio uh, of 1 to 2 to 3 to 1. So we have a, a mole ratio in a balanced equation. A and B will be lost or consumed by the reaction from their initial concentrations that will go down. C and D, we're sort of assuming, are starting out at zero moles per liter, and they will be going, going up. Notice in the data table that it tells us the concentrations of A and B, and it has these very tiny little, little zeros right here, which could reference the idea of time zero. Um, in other words, that's the initial amount before the reaction begins, at time equals zero seconds. You could also think about that O as the original concentration uh, instead of a zero, but be that as wh whichever one you prefer, the little zero or the little O rep references the initial or the original or the time equals zero concentration of each of these substances. So it's kind of repeating what the table's heading says, which is that those are the initial concentrations of reactants A and B. And then it's giving us the rate of the reaction in moles per liter per hour. It's giving it to us in molarity per hour. And you'll find that rate of reaction is always given in some unit of molarity or moles per liter per unit of time. It could be in seconds, could be minutes, could be hours. Those are the only ones I've really ever seen. Um, this one being hours. And so molarity changes. We measure the rate of the reaction here by how the molarity changes every hour that the reaction takes place. Okay. Sometimes that column will tell you it's the rate at which a particular substance is being formed. So it might tell us how fast D is being formed, per, for example. It could also tell us uh, how fast A or B or perhaps is being used up. But here it's being kind of vague, and just saying the initial rate of the reaction. So that's our reaction rate, and we're going to need that in our calculations here. So let me clean this out just a little bit, a little bit of our extra stuff up here. We'll kind of get going with a, a problem like this. Um, what you want to do, and in the, in the introductory video that I've used the year that I'm recording this video, the introductory video sort of works through this idea from the more mathematical approach. And I actually prefer, for one of the few things in our course, I actually prefer the less mathematical approach on this one, which is a little bit more concise, I think, and a little bit less overwhelming with, with calculations, but still serves the purpose of explaining how the reaction is taking place and helping us to figure out uh, what the differential rate law answers will be, what the rate order is, what the rate uh, rate law with respect to each of the reactants is going to be. And you'll find on this instruction page here, it tells you for each data set below, determine the order of each reactant or the order of the reaction with respect to each reactant. It also wants the, the overall rate law expression, which will follow the rate law template that's given here. So our eventual rate law expression should follow that the overall order of the reaction, which is just the sum 
of the answers from A, the sum of the reactant orders. So once we figure out what the order is with respect to each of our reactants, we'll be adding those all up. And the sum then is the overall reaction order, and we'll do that when we get there. And then the value of the rate constant is calculating K. So that's this guy right here in the equation. And basically that's going to just mean rearranging the equation once you've written the, uh, the real law expression, rearranging it and solving for K using data from the data table. That's the basic kind of background on it. So let's get started. So the way that we approach this can be different depending on how, how you're, uh, you're introduced to it. Again, the way that I like to do it here is to sort of consider it as um, looking at it from the perspective of taking two experiments in this data table and looking for two experiments in which one of the concentrations is being held constant or staying the same and where the other one is changing as a result of it, or rather the other concentration is, is being changed. And so what I want to look at, and I'm going to start out here, and you don't have to start with any particular reactant, but I'm going to start uh, by looking at experiments two and four. And the reason that I choose those is that in experiments two and four, the concentration of, of B is being held constant. These are equal. So those, are, those need to be held constant. We would think about that sort of like a control variable, if you will. On the other hand, while that one's being held constant, A is changing. We can see that in, in experiment 4, the concentration of A is 0.12. In, in experiment 2, the concentration is twice that at 0.24. You'll find that often on these sorts of problems, the concentrations are easy multiples of 2 or multiples of 3 or 4. And we'll be looking for that because we can expect relatively easy math. So in this first uh, example then, or this first calculation, we're going to be looking at and, and looking at the, the star of our show here, which is the one that's changing. A, reactant A, is doubling in concentration between experiment 4 and experiment 2. The question is, what's happening to the rate of the reaction at that same time? What's happening to the rate of the reaction when the A is doubled? We basically would expect that when A concentration is doubled in the reaction, there will be more A particles present, and that may or may not have an effect on the rate of the reaction. It typically does, but it doesn't have to. So how does changing the A's concentration, in this case doubling the concentration of A, affect the rate of the reaction over here in our final column? So if I look at those same two rows, I can see that as, as A is being doubled, the rate of the reaction is going from 0.5 moles per liter per hour, or mol molarity per hour, to two moles per liter per hour. That's an increase, hopefully we recognize, of four times. So while the concentration of A is doubled, the rate of the reaction is actually being quadrupled. How do we turn that then into the answer for our A here with, with, with uh, respect to concentration of reactant A, the order of each reactant? How we phrase that or how we sort of recognize that then, and we're solving again first for, for concentration of A here. I would say that here is, as the concentration of A is doubled, again, specifically we're looking at experiments uh, 4 versus experiment 2, as the ones that I'm, I'm referring to, in experiment 4 versus experiment 2, as the concentration of A is doubled, the reaction rate does what? Well, it goes up by a factor of 4. The reaction rate increases 4 times. You could say it quadruples, if you like. The reaction rate increases four times. So as A goes up 2x two times, the rate goes up four times. Or we could say that it goes up two times, and then another two times. Okay, two times, and then another two times, right? That's four times. So the reaction rate increases four times. And a last little way to sort of think about that, then, is as this concentration of A goes up by a factor of 2 to the power of 1, the rate goes up by a factor of 2 to the power of 2, right? It goes up four times. And that's really the, the sort of most definitive way to see the order of this reaction with respect to reactant A. It's at looking at this little power right here. As A is increased by, the, by a power of, of 1, or it's doubled by a power of 1, the rate of the reaction is increased 2 to the power of 2. And so this little number right here in this instance then gives us the order. This reaction then is second order with respect to reactant A. And that's the phrasing that you'll see a lot with respect to the concentration of A. So as we manipulate A, 
and double it, the reaction doubles not once, but twice. It doubles and then doubles, or it quadruples. We see that in the data. And so that because it doubles twice, the reaction is second order. The rate doubles twice. And that's the number that we're looking for. Doubles two times when the concentration doubles once. So that's our first, our first answer is, is to determine it for A, and we're going to do the same thing for B. If I look at my data table again, and I'll switch colors here, I'm going to look at experiment one and two. Experiment one and two, because in experiment one and two, the other concentration is held constant. A is staying the same at 0.24 moles per liter, but B is being quadrupled. 0.12 versus 0.48. So as we look at that, B is increasing in concentration four times. What's happening to the reaction's rate? It's also increasing four times. And when these are the same, when, when a concentration increase four times over leads to a reaction rate increase four times over, those are the same. That's, that's what we recognize as a first order reaction. So because the, uh, quadrupling B led to a equivalent quadrupling in reaction rate, that's first order. So as B concentration is quadrupled, or we can say increased four times, the reaction rate is also increased four times. When these are the same four times and four times, that's like a one-to-one -one ratio, right? A one-to-one -one relationship. Doubling it would double the reaction rate. Tripling it would triple the reaction rate. Increasing it four times over would increase it four times. And that's what we're seeing in the reaction rate here. So this ratio that we looked for in the last one, and we kind of identified as a, as a one-to-two ratio in the last one, we're seeing here as a, a four-to-four ratio, which is basically a one to one ratio. And it's this number here in the second part of that ratio that gives us the rate order, okay, is the idea. And so we would say that the reaction is first order with respect to concentration of B. So we've figured out we have a first order reaction with respect to B and a second order reaction with respect to A. If there was a third reactant involved, we'd need to do the same thing for that concentration as well, but we've only got A and B here, so we're good to go. Now, what about the rate law expression? The rate law expression, so this is all part of answering um, part A of are the instructions. Are they lettered A? Yes, excuse me. So we've got that letter A part done second order with respect to A and first order with respect to B. The rate law expression then, which is what B is asking us for, is going to follow this, this template at the top. Rate equals K times each reactant's concentration raised to its order. M and N and P, etc., etc. These little powers then are the rate, sorry, rate order for each reactant that we just figured out. And so we just figured out that it was second order with respect to A and first order with respect to B. And so my rate law expression, as I work to can uh, answer part B here, will be written by that template rate equals K, which is our constant to be determined in a moment here. Concentration of A, we said was second order. And then concentration of B, we said was first order. And you wouldn't have to write that one, it's implied of course, but that's our rate law expression for that particular reaction. Hopefully that kind of makes some sense. The overall rate order, part C, is simply taking the individual rate orders and adding them together. So the overall rate order for this reaction would be a two plus one. From, from each of these uh, amounts that we, or rather the the uh, orders that we figured out for each of the the reactants A and B already, so it was second order with respect to A, first order with respect to B. The overall rate order is simply the sum of those individual uh, reactant rate orders. So it's this is third order overall. We don't often use that overall rate order very much. It doesn't have a whole lot of usefulness for, for us um, beyond this. There must be some things that you'll see it, uh, in, and if you get further into your study of kinetics. 
and uh, rate laws, but in, in our course we really don't use the overall rate order too very much beyond this. D is asking us to calculate K, calculate the rate constant. So to find K, we're going to take this equation from up here on B, and we're going to rearrange it to get the K by itself. So K is basically rate over the concentration of A to the power of 2, and the concentration of B to the power of 1. I just rearranged my answer from B to get K by itself, because they want us to calculate K. So to do that, we're going to take the rate and the concentrations of A and B from any row of our data table. And we can just pick whichever row you want. You're going to get the same answer no matter which rows you choose. So as long as you choose a row that's complete, you're going to get the right answer. Now in my data table, I have complete data for experiments 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. You can choose any one of those rows. I can't choose 6 because they haven't given us the rate there. They're going to want us to figure out what that rate is um, in, in many of these problems. Uh, but as it is here, that concentration uh, rather, that rate isn't given. And so, if I'm going to choose data from one of the other rows, I'm going to go ahead with trial, or experiment rather, should stick with the right vocabulary, I guess. I'm going to use experiment 1 from my data table. In experiment 1, I would have uh, a rate of 8 molarity per hour. That's my rate value in the last column of the table. For the concentrations for A, I have 0 0.240 molar, and that one's going to be squared. And then for B, I have 0 0.480 molar, and that one's going to be to the first power. Now, we often get away from using units when we're calculating things like KEQ because the units aren't part of the answer, but here, They'll specifically ask you for the units on your rate constant. When you're, actu when you're calculating K, you'll absolutely need to have the units along with it. So what will those units be okay, when we work this all out? We can go to the calculator here, punch, this number, punch the numbers in, and we'll get an answer of around 289. But that's not the whole answer. We need units on this as well. What are the units on this? Well, let's go back to what was in the problem. We're going to have units of molarity per hour from the numerator. So I have molarity per hour, pardon me, just from my numerator from the rate. And then the denominator here, I have another molarity squared and then another molarity. So that's three more molarities, but those are in the denominator, right? So I have in the, in the denominator of my value here, molarity to the third power. And I just put a one on the top to force those molarity units to the denominator of my, of my answer here. So this comes from the rate, and then this, this part of my units are going to come from my, my uh, concentrations of A and B. But let's put all that together. What is that? 289. Molarity here can cancel one of these, and that's going to leave me two units of molarity in the denominator, right? So my units will be 200, well, my answer will be 289, but the units will be molarity to the negative 2, because it's in the denominator, and hours to the negative 1, because it's also in the denominator. The units on the rate law constant are one of the wonkiest things of this whole unit, I'll be honest with you. They're just not comfortable to us. They're weird. They have negatives in them a lot. <clears throat> we don't see a lot of units like that. If you're not as comfortable with the idea of negative units um, as we've written them here, you don't have to write them that way. You could literally take what I had here um, in, the, in the kind of process of figuring out those units and write your answer as 289 and then since the units were all down here in the denominator, you could just write your unit as 1 over molarity squared and then hours. And that would be in the denominator. This is These are the same thing, right? These are exactly the same. When we have negative powers on our unit, that just forces the unit to the denominator of our answer. I don't know that either one of those is any prettier than the other, but either one of those would be acceptable for your answer for the rate law constant. The other piece of this, and it's not in the instructions on this page, but we do have a data table here that has a missing unit, right? So it doesn't in the instructions say you need to figure out the question mark, but I think we should take a, take a minute and do that. What about this question mark in our data table? We've missed, they don't have the rate. They're asking us to, to calculate the rate for experiment six based on the concentrations that we're putting in, what rate would we expect? And so these concentrations become part of our, our calculation. We're just we're going to calculate rate using the rate law expression that we figured out uh, when we wrote that out in part B. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's figure out the missing question mark. So let's just kind of add this in as our sort of follow-up. 
the question mark part of our data table. To do that, that's a rate. We're going to use our rate law expression from part B. But now we know what K is. K is 289, molarity to the negative 2, and hours to the negative 1. That's our K value. Okay, so I'm, I'm just populating this equation from part B with data from trial 6. Right? The concentration of A in trial 6 is 0 .1, 0 .0 0 0.0140. 0 0.0140 molarity. That one's squared. And then the concentration of B is 1.35 mol moles per liter. Now, what, what's going to happen to my units here? If I go to my calculator and I punch all this in, I get an answer of 0.0765. Okay. And that's fine, but what are the units on my answer? This is a rate. And so rate should always be, like it was in my data table at the beginning of the problem, rate should always be molarity per unit of time, or moles per liter per unit of time. This is molarity per hour. Do our units work out for that? You can assume that they will, but it's good to check that they do, because that, that'll help us to recognize if we've made a mistake earlier in our problem, and hopefully we haven't. Okay. So how do those units work out to be that? Well, essentially, here in the, in the A term, we're going to have molarity squared, and over here in our original K value, our K constant, we have molarity to the negative 2. So molarity squared cancels out molarity to the negative 2. And that leaves us with what units? Well, molarity and then hour in the denominator. So sure enough, molarity per hour will be our units as we calculate the value for that missing question mark space in our data table. That's just my walkthrough of, of one differential rate law problem. And honestly, the other ones that are on this assignment aren't too, too, too very much different. But in order to keep this video from getting too long, I'll stop it there. And then I'll make another video of solving one more problem with maybe a little different variety in some of those rate laws with respect to some of the reactants. We'll talk to you then. Thanks.